What is up, everybody? Welcome to Fantasy Football Across America. I'm here live in Long Island with on, Theo Grimm. On Long Island. On Long, on Island. Long Island. I, I man, I, should we just restart the episode? On no, that? it's a Long Island faux pas. You have to say <laughs> on Long Island, on Long Island. But welcome, Dario. We're happy to have you on Long Island. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. You know, just very. It was it was nice meeting your kids this morning. I was they were real, really friendly. Like just just really good vibe here at the Greminger household. And uh, like I said, absolutely had to make a stop here when I knew that I was going to be traveling from New York. New York Monday, I was at the Jets game, and then you know Thursday night I'll be at the the Philly game. So you know just get getting through. And knew I wanted to see my man Theo in person. So and, how you and been? And for for Long Island people, Dario <laughs> managed to get into Suffolk County and Nassau County, so he hit both counties of, of Long Island in one trip, which was a shout out to him. <laughs> and now you're going to see multiple boroughs this evening, which is cool too. You're going to Brooklyn and Manhattan, right? Yeah, yeah. That's and fine. so you'll go through Queens to get there. So you actually hit three, three boroughs, which is good. Nice. Yeah. I think. Well, and I drove through the Bronx yesterday when I crossed over. So. so and then you're going to Philly after this, right? Yeah. So you're going to drive through Staten Island too, Dar. You're going to hit Boom. all five boroughs. There you go. All five boroughs. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. Speaking of boroughs, ooh, rough week one. Yeah, not a great, uh, not a great week for for my Joe Burrow stack team. I have a I have a Joe Burrow Jamar Chase team that did not do very well, but but it you know it's week one. Yeah, yeah. Bengals got smoked last just, year in week one, so you know they'll yeah. bounce back. Yeah. Anyway, before we get into it, I, I'm, we're gonna we're gonna hear the backstory of Theo Gravinger. We're gonna hear about his philosophies in Dynasty, and also just, just a little bit about you that maybe the people who listen to these fantasy podcasts don't get to know most of the time. So I'm excited to get into it. First, we're going to listen to a quick word from our sponsor. Hey, so many ask me, what's wrong with sports books? Why so many of them fail? The answer is simple. They don't innovate. They're just casino sports books on a phone. That's all they've been. There are a few that are doing a good job. We partner with them. Most of them, not so much. Until Bet Openly came along. Bet Openly said, hey, we're going to innovate. We're going to do something groundbreaking. We're going to have peer-to-peer betting in all states, and you pay 1%. When you win, you pay just 1% on your winnings. You heard that right. It's 1%. With code Underworld, you qualify for just that 1% transaction fee on bet openly. It gives you ultimate flexibility to set your own lines and browse lines that others have set. Think about it. That's what betting should be. And now that is the reality. BetOpenly.com. The code is Underworld. Check it out. All right. Welcome back. Once again, I'm on Long Island with Theo Greminger. This is Fantasy Football Across America. And Theo, let's get things started. When was, do you remember the first fantasy football league that you played in? It was probably with my college buddies. I never, I never played, like, I didn't play fantasy early. Like some of these people you hear, like, they played when they're 12 or something. I didn't. I probably definitely did never played in high school. It was probably in college. And then it became something like I thought I was very sharp at gambling. Um, and it kind of like went hand in hand. I thought it was something I could figure out, but I did a lot better with the fantasy football than I did with the gambling. Yeah. So I stuck with the fantasy <laughs> and uh, the fantasy is football is something I think you get a little bit more of an edge in than like, let's say trying to pick winners. So that's something that I just started doing. And, you know, I did well in home leagues and then tried to like take it up a notch I guess it's probably the story for a lot of people. Um, but it was something that I figured I could I could beat the system. And you don't always beat the system, but you definitely can have winning years every year, I think, if you figure this thing out. And so the, walk me through that. I guess that's um, maybe, what, two th- early 2000s? Like, do you remember yeah, the first probably, pick you made? You know, I'll say the first, like, smash picks I, I made – Um, I remember the guy that kind of won me a lot of leagues was year two, Jimmy Graham. Oh yeah. And so Jimmy Graham was like a, a basketball player at the university of Miami. He was a guy that came in and kind of flashed as a rookie, but didn't certainly wasn't a guy you ever started. Maybe averaged five points a game, six points a game in fantasy. And then he went from a six point uh, year one, to like an 18 point per game um, year two. And he had one of the best tight end seasons, you know, of all time. This was like the heyday of Gronk and and Jimmy Graham at the same time. And I think I had a, I want to say I had a Gronk Jimmy Graham team one year, but it was like early on those Jimmy Graham years. And then obviously 
Um, I had, there was a year where Josh Gordon went absolutely nuts. Right. And Josh Gordon was like a seventh round draft pick and he finished as wide receiver one overall. And I had a lot of Josh Gordon that year. So I had a lot of like pretty profitable years early um, in the process uh, in a bunch of like home leagues. And that was kind of like what got me on, on this, on this track. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was definitely, those guys kind of stand out. And I'll say Antonio Brown was another guy that I was always drafting Antonio Brown. It seemed like the correct season. Um, and he had multiple years of finishing his wide receiver one overall was wild 25 point per game type season. So I was kind of on those guys who were kind of like stand out to me at least for, I guess almost 20 years ago at this point, kind of draft picks. That's Antonio. That, I remember Antonio well, Brown Antonio and Jimmy Bro- Graham. That's yeah. That's but 10 it, years ago. <laughs> no, 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 Jimmy, Jimmy. Gra- so I'll say Jimmy Graham's first season where he was impactful. Was probably, I'm talking it was 2012, 2012, right? 2011. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at that, but I think, you know, this was a while ago. Jimmy Graham's been, yeah. been, been out here doing it. I mean, he's still doing it. He's, he's, he's still on the Saints like, right now. It's, it's wild <laughs> times. Speak. And then I'm trying um, to think of my very first pick. I, th- I think maybe I had some Calvin Johnson teams too, but again, that's, you're going way, way back. Yeah. And then let's talk to, I mean, you're obviously known for your dynasty prowess in particular. Yeah. Do you remember your first dynasty league and what has, you know, what drew you to that in particular? So it was, it was a, we, I think we did a keeper league, maybe a first, first time I did any kind of dynasty, somewhat dynasty was keepers. And then I joined kind of like my first true dynasty league, uh, with rookie drafts and everything like that. And it just was something that made a lot of sense. And it was tied in, you know, college football prospects, uh, regular fantasy. Uh, and it was also, you know, I made some money the first year. So I kind of got like hooked on it. And I feel like Dynasty is an even bigger edge, um, you know, for making money in fantasy. Because when you enter a redraft league in, you know, it's 12 guys or 12 people drafting against one another, when the draft goes down, every single person's trying to win the league. But if you do a dynasty startup, I'd say only about eight people are going for it. Usually mm-hmm. there's about four people that are like deeply planning for the, for the future. Uh, one or two of those people is going to do it incorrectly. Uh, and then maybe two of them actually do like a, a true productive struggle. So I feel like there's, there's less competition in dynasty for making money. Uh, and the, you know, there's a lot of edges you can have. Uh, in dynasty because i think a lot of people are kind of perpetually reloading they like having good looking rosters more so than like actually churning out wins Mm. um so dynasty was something where i just felt like i had an edge in and then you dive further and further into something and and it dynasty is just something that even if you're drafting a tremendous amount of best ball teams or you have a lot of redraft uh skin in the game dynasty is something that like is always on your mind no matter how many dynasty teams you you have there's always like one or two dynasty teams where you know your entire roster without having to look at it. <laughs> and it just kind of like captivates you in the off season. And then you have the rookie. We're spending like four months talking about these rookie draft picks. Yeah. And then you actually get to do it. And then you have the roster to deal with and trades and all these kind of things. So dynasty was something that just came, became kind of like captivating for me and all encompassing uh, and then I had, you know, the chance to podcast with the Goat District, uh, and we did a lot of Dynasty content. And then this year, I've had a chance to podcast with Matt uh, on the Sonic Truth podcast, which has just been tremendous. So um, Dynasty is something where I did, you know, if you when I first started fantasy football content, I probably never thought I'd be this deep into the Dynasty game, but it's just something that I've dove into and I have a lot of love for, and I think. You have to like really, really like what you're doing when you're doing content. And I I love Dynasty. I could talk Dynasty with you all day, Dario. Yeah, no, I mean, I believe me. You and I have been working hand in hand for, you know, managing the player profiler Dynasty rankings now for a few months now. Yeah. And uh, I'm I'm well aware of we and we 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 go we go super deep with it. Like, I think it's to get like a a picture kind of behind the process is like Matt. Matt Kelly, Dario, and I are continually discussing dynasty and dynasty rankings. It's very hands-on. It's 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 very, uh, you know, it's very deep discussions. I'd say, like mm-hmm. me and you, will have a discussion about a guy who might be side by side in the dynasty rankings 
and go back and forth for like half an hour on like why this guy should be ranked ahead of this guy or and vice like versa. The, and it's like the RB50. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's and it's I think it's just you have to have a passion for it. And you also have like a I feel like like there's a lot of people that kind of depend on our dynasty rankings. And I think that that's like a great responsibility. And I think me and you both put like a lot of time and energy into it. And Matt does all the time too. So it's, it's awesome. I, I love doing it and I love like getting into it. And I think having like healthy debates is, is an awesome thing. I think if we just agreed on every single guy in dynasty, it would, it would not be as good of a process. Yeah, no, totally. I think that that, that makes sense hundred percent. And yeah, I mean, I feel like I've learned a lot from you just like in how you're thinking about players in, you know, as I've managed kind of like the data side of that operation, but I guess on a slightly broader picture, like what would you say if you could summarize your dynasty philosophy in 30 seconds or one minute, like how would you tell someone to like, what's what are the secrets to winning your league? Anytime I have a startup, I want to have wide receiver strength. I think that, you know, running backs can be fleeting wide receiver strength is something that sticks with you long enough. If I'm deep enough and I'm strong enough at the wide receiver position, then I can do anything I want with my dynasty roster. I'll give you a, a case in point, Dario. If we were just doing a dynasty startup two seasons ago, Jonathan Taylor, Cam Akers, J.K. Dobbins, all those guys DeAndre from that, Swift. DeAndre Swift, every single guy from that class was you were using top three round draft capital to get. Maybe not Acres at that point, but Jonathan Taylor would have cost you, you know, top five pick in a lot of these formats. Um, and the running back room changes rapidly. Look at the descent from jo from a guy like Todd Gurley or Le'Veon Bell finishing running back one overall and looking like a like a Teflon flawless guy in fantasy. Their rapid fall happens so quickly at the running back position, but at the wide receiver position, usually when we get a breakout type guy, especially early on, if he checks off most of the boxes, then that kind of guy retains value. So for me, I always like my dynasty teams when I'm not necessarily punting running back, but running back is always secondary. If it's a tiebreaker between the two positions, I'm usually going wide receiver. Even if that means I have way too many wide receivers, uh, I'll figure it out when I get there. And the first position you trade when you're trying to rebuild or you throw in the towel for the season in Dynasty, is your veteran running backs. So yeah. I can always go in eight and week eight, week nine, and get myself a veteran running back that can help me down the stretch. But the ability to add quality wide receivers, you only really find in the rookie drafts or the Dynasty startups. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I mean, it's kind of like the zero RB philosophy that people apply to redraft extended to Dynasty. And it only makes even more sense because of the unpredictability of running back careers and age curves and all, all these things that have been uh, kind of analyzed to death, but it's good to, to repeat it back to the people. Yeah. Zero RB is a great strategy in startups. Like you can definitely do that. And you can also do an anchor RB in startups where, you know, I drop one high value draft pick on a running back, but I usually it's not my first round pick this year, a little different. Cause I do think Bijan was, flawless but dario even like a Brees hall and a john and a jonathan taylor this year had certain little red flags like the quality mm -hmm. of the offense for taylor especially after anthony richardson um was drafted his ability to get targets and then Brees hall obviously with the injury so i think the less big bets i have to make at the running back position the better and you always find those guys in the second half like the after round 10 if you want to you know try to play catch up so mm -hmm. That's my my best advice is stick to wide receivers and startups. That's I mean I feel like the, that's a great great piece of advice right there for anyone getting started. And let's go a little broader, a little less fantasy related. Sure. What's your one like what got you to love football? Like do, is there do, is there a moment that comes to mind or like why it, it, would you say Okay, so I'll say that I grew up in Washington DC and I would say the Washington Redskins at the time, now the Commanders, former formerly Washington football team, uh, they won the Super Bowl when I was a little boy, um, and they won two Super Bowls. One when I was probably, you know, ten, and one a couple years before that, uh, where they beat the Broncos and then they beat the Bills with Mark Rippon, 
And it was kind of like a football town growing up uh, where, you know, there was, you know, a lot of love for it and you kind of get into it and you get hooked like anything else. So we also had a Washington, D.C. was less of a college football town uh, and more of a pro football town. So I think if you maybe if you grew up in Alabama or you grew up in Columbus, Ohio, or you grew up in Michigan, you know, your love might have been Saturdays. But for me, it was always Sundays. And then obviously I became more of a, a college football fan as I got a little bit older, you know, middle school, high school, so middle school probably for college football. But NFL football, I feel like was early on and you just get in the habit of watching it. And this was, you know, I'm older than you, Dario, you didn't know. <laughs> so we didn't have the opportunity to watch a million different games and we didn't have the opportunity to watch Red Zone. So you would watch the games that were on. Uh, and then I think also for me, besides, you know, local football was, you know, when I was in my like main football stage where, you know, you're like 12 and 11 and starting to understand the game a lot more, you know, that was when we had real dynasties in the NFL. You had the Joe Montana 49ers. Uh, then you also had the Steve Young 49ers teams, which were monster powerhouses. And then those Dallas Cowboy teams were like larger than life, like the Troy mm -hmm. Aikman, Emmett Smith. Um, Michael Irvin, those teams, uh, those teams were also very big for just drawing you in. Um, so I would say that it was just the way I grew up and just kind of the game kind of evolves and you just don't stop. And then I think once you start entering college into the mix, then your whole weekend is kind of based on, on football. So that's kind of, I think where it started for me. Yeah. Who's your, who's your college team that you root for? Uh, so I went to university of Maryland, so I, you know, but I'm, I'm realistic. We're not going to beat your <laughs> USC Trojans. Uh, for me, I had a number of years where I supported the LSU Tigers. It just sort of happened. Uh, there was teams that I absolutely rooted for and was just so into LSU. I still like LSU. Uh, I don't feel as much of a connection to like Brian Kelly, LSU. And obviously, you know, when I get older, I don't watch every single game, but there were certain years where I'd watch every single LSU game. Um, but I'd say I'm right now I'm kind of a college football neutral. Um, if you, if you're, if you're going by like what t-shirts I have in my drawer, I definitely have a Maryland t-shirt and an LSU t-shirt, <laughs> but I, I like watching the big games, um, you know, here on long Island, I'd say it's kind of funny because it's, we're here in the, in the Eastern part of the United States, but it's, it's kind of big 10 country in long, in long Island. Cause you have a lot of people who went to Penn state, a lot of people who went to Michigan, a lot of people who went to, you know, Wisconsin and all these different big 10 schools. Um, so, you know, occasionally I'll pop on a, a Big Ten game here and there. But for me, I'm watching – if I can watch one college football game a week, I'm watching the best game I can watch. It's not yeah. like specific college. So, um, you know, I've been very – and also I love Deion Sanders. So I've been kind of a a, a, a sneaky Colorado you're, supporter you're, you're right Colorado, now. You're the, you're, the Colorado band, shirt is like in your online oh, shopping cart it. right now. I'm buying – they're you cannot buy – a Colorado football shirt now. That's the Deion Sanders effect. They, yeah. They're 2 0. They have a loaded roster. And you also can't buy a Coach Prime Colorado shirt. They're like, it's crazy. The yeah. guys, and they're also the most bet on team. They, they get yeah. like three times the bet. It's, it's insane. Yeah. So, yeah, go Colorado. No, they're definitely changing the dynamic. I mean, that was. That was just crazy how they were, you know, favored by only three and a half against Nebraska, and everyone knew that, that wasn't yeah. even going to be close. Yeah, and and everybody thought they were smart by betting against Co Coach Prime. And I'll say that Sanders, his son, is awesome. I think that that kid is going to be a first round NFL pick, hands down. And I think by the end of the season, it's going to be like such a discussion of Caleb Williams, and then after that, you're going to have may or sanders it's awesome we'll be talking about that daria when we yeah, when we do dynasty we rankings later once, on once the nfl season ends and yeah. we are in, in the thick of it in january I'm, I'm sure we will and then all right let's you know i kind of want to move away from football sure. for a little bit part of the you know my idea behind this show is to give people a, a window into the analysts that they're used to hearing talk about these fantasy stats and just like something about them as people outside of our i guess you know our jobs and our, our hobby for for this because i think that you know we're all more than this one dimension yeah. so for starters what do you enjoy about living on long island what makes this place home for you oh i, I love long island so i didn't grow up here um when i first moved to new york i lived in in new york city uh for a number of years with my wife and then we moved out after we had our first kid 
and we knew we were going to go to a, a suburb. But my wife actually grew up on on Long Island, so um, we just ended up here. And we knew we wanted to be close enough to the city because I was commuting in uh, for work. And you know, we ended up in Nassau County, and and I I just love it. I've lived in again the Washington D.C. area. I lived in Philadelphia at the time, and uh, now I live here. And I just think Long Island's great. It's uh, there's always a lot going on. There's a million things to do. The beach is very close to us, so we can get to the beach pretty quickly. Um, some beautiful beaches here. Uh, you have access to pretty much anything you you like. Um, it, it's very very built up, but it's it's great. And a lot of people complain about the uh, the traffic, but I'll say for me, when I have to drive places, uh, especially by myself, I don't mind it because I'll pop in, you know, one of our podcasts <laughs> or something like that. And I'm able to kind of catch up on 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 uh, on work uh, de facto. So there's there's a lot to like about Long Island. I think it's a it's a great you know sense of community. Uh, there's great food. There's great people. Um, and you know, for where I live, we we really like the schools for for my kids as well. So I uh, highly recommend it, Dar- Dario. I told you yeah. you're getting a chance to see the whole country. <laughs> you're you're welcome to end up here on Long Island. I'm sure we have a couple of transplanted Californians. You'll fit right in. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's interesting seeing a lot of these places because I've never really been much outside of the western half of the U.S. Like even going past Denver yeah. was, was pretty rare for me. Like, I, you know, been on flights, you know, been to Boston once or twice. Like, you you've, you you know, you go coast to coast probably, yeah. Dario. So, they, yeah, it's very so, cool that you're getting to see everything. Yeah, no, no flying over this time. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, so it's it, like Long Island so far. I mean, I was driving in at night yesterday, so I didn't see too much. But this morning... It's a pretty sunrise, and I, I like. I didn't expect it to be this woodsy, this close yeah. to New York City. I was so, telling so you earlier. For, for any Long Island people out there, Dario got to go to Huntington, which always a lot going on in, in Huntington, and uh, he's in Roslyn with me right now. So again, both both uh, counties, he said, this is this is a Long Island adventure for you, Dario. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. And then, what's something that you? enjoy thinking about like i don't know a hobby or just a, a type of maybe another interest that you have when you're when your headspace is like i've had enough football for today or okay. i'm so just like so i else. am i am a for sport okay i'll give you a sports one i'll give you a non-sports so non-sports i like lifting weights and i do do that pretty much every day it's kind of like uh like therapy for me I, if i don't do it i'm, I'm going nuts <laughs> um i have a couple of other interests here and there um, nothing that interesting. Like, I don't know. I loved the Sopranos for many years and, and I enjoy a good Marvel movie, but nobody's interested in that. I'd say for me, sports wise, I am a diehard U S men's national team soccer fan. I am a technically a card carrying American outlaw, which is the, the, the supporters club. Oh, wow. Um, and I used to go to a lot of games, but now I have three kids. So I, I rarely get to it. I might go see the U S versus Germany. Um, they play in October in Hartford, Connecticut, which is a doable trip. Um, I might be going to that game, but I'm a huge U S national team fan. I live and die with each game. I rarely, rarely miss a live U S game. And if I do, it's DVR. When I was in Las Vegas, I missed our game against Uzbekistan, but I got a chance to see it on DVR. And last night we thrashed Oman for nothing. We took it to him. Oh man. Oh man for Oman. (laughs) But yeah, it's 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 the U.S. national team. I live and die with that team more than any team uh, in sports. I feel it when we lose. I'm excited when we win, and it's more of a sense of relief a lot of times when you win in soccer. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it just became something where I fell in love with the team probably when I was a little bit younger, but the the deep love and passion probably was like early 2000s. But we had a we had a run to the final eight of the World Cup when I was younger, and we beat Mexico in the round of 16 in that World Cup, which was massive because in Washington, D.C., where I grew up, there was definitely a lot of like L3 fans as well, and that was a massive win for the U.S. And after that, I was kind of hooked, and then after like maybe 2000, it started to be like a passion where I wouldn't miss a game. i watch all the friendlies and – that's that's it. Dario. Yeah, if you no, want to, awesome. if you want to, if somebody wants to get under my skin, you know, it's not <laughs> fantasy football takes. It's people who talk trash about the U.S. Te- national team or will remind me about a loss. That's that's how you get under my skin. everyone. So <laughs> good to know. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll uh, stay away 
from that after if there if there's any yeah like, it's just it's just what, what it's are, a low blow okay. you know do you like our chances for the 2026 cup absolutely because you're a home nation we have a golden generation of players uh i think for me i'm going to be very disappointed if we don't make the final four i think that needs to be the the reasonable expectation is a home nation with this sort of talent that's consistently when they make the world cup, we make the knockout stage, which is the round of 16. You get the boost by playing at home. You've had plenty of, of teams that, that check this off when South Korea was hosting, they made the final four when Ghana was playing in Africa in the only world cup that was in Africa, mm -hmm. Ghana makes the final eight and they should have made the final four. They were, they were very unlucky at the end. Yeah. Um, Luis Suarez. so there's, there's a million different, um, there's a million different, uh, like things where you can, you can point this out, but usually the home nation has a bit of an advantage. Um, and I think for us, it's, it's a, it's a great opportunity. I think the, the, the Netherlands game was a poor way to end what I think was a very good world cup, but I, I don't think that that game was indicative of how competitive we were and, and where we're at. So yeah. that's for me. And we have a Copa America this coming summer uh which is huge for us because is it another one of the like both north and south yep. america copa america they're doing it in the united states okay and it's going to be a huge deal it's a huge deal for us it's also a huge deal for mexico which has been struggling mexico tied uzbekistan last night dario shout out to any l3 fans watching we beat <laughs> uzbekistan three nothing and you tied them three three but it's a big deal for the u.s and mexico to play these copa america games we don't have to qualify for the World Cup, so these tournaments mean a lot more to us. Um, so we really need to have a mentality that we're going to win the Copa America or at least like get a chance to go deep and play a team like Argentina, play a team like Brazil, play a team like Colombia, and you know beat those people because we're at home, and that's the mentality you have to have. So yeah. you'll find me next summer at the Copa America 100%. Where's, at a of these is games. there a game at MetLife, probably? There'll be a game. So last time that there was a Copa America in the United States, I went to a game in Chicago. I saw the United States play Costa Rica. We beat them 4 nothing. It was legendary. And this is when Costa Rica was really good. Um, I went to Philadelphia, and I saw the United States versus Paraguay. And that was a unbelievably good game. Um, mm -hmm. We ended up winning the game. And Paraguay uh, got to play 11 on 10. We had a guy red carded at like halftime. So I'll go all over the country for the Copa America and the yeah. World Cup. Like, oh, look, okay. Yeah, because I guess you don't know where the U.S. You don't know where they'll play. Gonna be drawn, and right, and right. there's always somewhere relatively close. So Right. I mean, yep. especially yeah, here on the middle yep. of the eastern seaboard. Um, I just remembered, I, I think something that we have to mention on this show is this, this running joke that we have at, you know, in these meetings where... I have never seen any of the movies or, or get gone oh, yeah. to any of the references that you guys are so, making. So let's, I'm going to frame this. Like, what are the top three movies that I should see when I, I mean, I don't know when I'll okay, be able to so carve out two hours, but I'll, I'll say, I'll say there's some shocking results from this. So Billy, <laughs> Billy, Billy Muzio, and I'll say Frank Lakatos and a couple other, I think maybe Nick Lynch uh, was involved in some of these calls. Yeah. Matt yeah, Kelly's sure. aware of it, but Dario, who's a younger guy, um, has no frame of reference for a lot of movies that we would consider. I think if you're like 30 plus, you would consider these to be kind of like every person needs to watch type movies. So Dario has Dario understands <laughs> Marvel movies. Yeah. He understands Star Wars movies. But when it comes to like he's OK. So, Dario, have you ever seen Goodfellas? I have not. OK. Dario, have you ever seen The Godfather? I can't say that I have. Okay, Dario, have you ever seen the Shawshank Redemption? I've been wanting to watch it. I, I've heard it's you know incredible, and I, I've been wanting to watch it for a long time. Dario, have you Dario, have you okay? And then then me. it's not just gangster movies. Dario, have you ever seen Back to the Future? I've heard it. It's overrated. Okay, but you haven't seen it. No, I've I made a Biff Tannen reference one time, which it was the guy who went back in time and gave his his former self, uh, the, all the sports almanac, which gave all the winners. And then, you know, the, the ripple effect of going back in time is that guy becomes like this mega rich person. So I made a reference about Biff Tannen and this is how this conversation started where Dario hasn't seen any of these movies. Okay. <laughs> Terminator two judgment day. No. Okay. So it's, it's not only gangster movies, but it's sci fi It's just basic movies, but you have seen Forrest Gump. Yes. Okay. So you've seen Forrest Gump. 
but you haven't seen any of these other ones. So I think we're gonna have to make a checklist. Yeah, Scar- yeah. Sorry, Scarface? Sorry. Scarface? No. Okay. So yeah. Dario hasn't seen any of them. <laughs> so but I'd say right, good so, fellas. So three. Pick, give me give me three to like absolutely to start with. Because I mean that, Okay, this, so this I'll go good, 20 hours of movies. You, you have you have to watch Godfather one and two and Goodfellas. You have okay. to. And if you want a non gangster movie, then I think you know Billy Muzio was very passionate about Shawshank Redemption, and I think most people would tell you that that's a great, great, great movie. But Goodfellas, Godfather, and Godfather Two, most people, like critic wise, are putting those in like their yeah. top fifty of all time movies too. Right. So these are it's cultural literacy. Yeah, at this no, point, I mean, Dario. I think I have my cultural literacy covered from like twenty ten onward. So that's that is true. <laughs> that is true. But if you ever if you ever bump into anybody over you know thirty. You've got to be able to have the you know a couple of these conversations. So, I would say the uh, those three movies definitely try to check them out on your journey. Yeah, I'll have to see. Okay, here here's here's a good one. Do you know what streaming services I can find those movies on? Because that's that's the breaking point. <laughs> no, I well I think that uh I would I think Goodfellas might be on one of the streaming services. Um, I don't know, Dario. Go to okay. Apple TV yeah, and type fine. them in. You're gonna see I'll, it. I'll look it up, but. And then I remember a couple of days ago, you and I were having a conversation about audiobooks because I was telling you, you know, yeah. I'm driving now. So audiobooks have become a must. And I was wondering, what would you say is like, if you can name one book that has shaped your worldview more than any other book in particular, like what's your top pick? So there's a lot of like non football books, but I'll say one book that I think applies to everyone, especially people who enjoy football, is, I'm trying to think if it's called The Perfect Pass or a, I think it's The Perfect Pass. So The Perfect Pass is written by a, an, an author who does like, you know, I think he does mostly history books, but like famous ones, mm-hmm. like US history books and that sort of thing. But he does a book about Mike Leach and Hal Mummy. And Mike Leach and Hal Mummy have made a bigger impact on the game of football, modern football, than I think any single coach um, or player has. So Mike Leach and Hal Mummy, Hal Mummy basically is where it started from. But Hal Mummy was a assistant who had gone all over the country, um, bouncing around from school to school, wants to run a passing system. Uh, modeled it after kind of a few different passing systems, goes to a high schools in Texas, leaves college football, goes to high schools in Texas, ends up getting hired at this lowest of low level colleges, an NAIA school called Iowa Wesleyan. And he ends up changing the entire game of football with his offensive system. He ends up hiring an assistant named Mike Leach, and Mike Leach was like the most interesting guy ever. And he mm-hmm. passed away last year, which is really, really sad because Mike Leach, I think, meant a lot to so many people. But basically, the story goes with these guys having this ascent, taking over this program, Iowa Wesleyan. The school goes from uh, NAIA to D2, basically because they built this football program. Then these guys go f- to Valdosta State. Then they end up in the SEC in the University of Kentucky. Mike Leach gets hired as Texas Tech's head coach, and that's kind of all she wrote. Um, but when you watch any NFL game and you watch any uh, high school game or any college game at this point, all of these principles are that were created at this tiny place um, are still utilized today. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like a innovation, creativity, and the ability to swing up and beat somebody with more resources than you these guys did all of these things and they did it with they did it with you know just incredible thought process not money this was all innovation they had less resources and were beating larger schools and it's just a it's it's like an emotional read and it's also very very inspiring for anybody who is creative or anybody who um you know feels like they're kind of outnumbered and and how to kind of a beat and it's also a beat the system uh, type type book as well. Like, I think Mike Leach could have done anything in in his life. I think you put Mike Leach in the military, he would have found a way to become like a general. If you put Mike Leach in big business, he would have been a CEO. I truly believe he's one of these guys that just figures things out. Um, obviously, how Mummy was like kind of his mentor, but it 
became larger with Leach. But mm -hmm. I recommend this book to anyone. I think it's it's the best football book I've ever read. It's one of the best nonfiction books out there. And it's a great book on tape, Dario. I've done it both ways, read it okay. and done it on tape. So highly recommend that for your trip as well. Yeah, I definitely want to check that out. I mean, I've, I'm aware of Mike Leach. Yeah. Because when I was kind of growing up in my football fandom, he was he was a Washington State coach. That's right. So he, he like you always knew Washington State was going to do some wacky stuff. Yeah. And, and run out these formations. And, I, you know, I've seen the, the clips on Twitter. He was definitely someone that all of college football and football in general was very fond of. And from, you know, an analytical mind, a lot of it was, you know, th this is the kind of things that these air raid offenses did. You know, how do you uh, overcompensate with a lesser offensive lineman? How do you overcompensate with um, maybe limited running backs? I mean, a million different things there that, that kind of apply to any anybody. But yeah, you're right. Mike Leach also coached, uh, you know, they had one of the most famous college games well, not ever, but you know, in the last 25 years, Bixis. Yeah, damn, I, I don't know if I remember that one. <laughs> yeah, was, so you could go back. They, they talk about that in the book, but it was Michael Crabtree, who I know you're aware of. Yeah. Michael Crabtree made this incredible catch uh, with no time remaining to beat Texas, and it was kind of like the pinnacle achievement of Mike Leach and this system that people kind of, and people tried to brush off the system for years and said it couldn't work. It couldn't work at a big school. It couldn't work. And he proved them wrong. And yeah. it worked everywhere. Washington state had some of their best years with him. Mississippi state was on the right track and uh, Texas tech definitely had their best years with him. Yeah. No, that sounds like an awesome read. And I think that's going to wrap it up for today's episode of fantasy football across America. So do you have any, Final words, anything to shout out where people can find you during this no, football you can, season? Well, you, you can find me on First Class Fantasy with Billy Muzio. You can find me on Press Coverage. Uh, you can find me on the Sonic Truth podcast. I have another Dynasty podcast called Dynasty Life starting up. And then I do Future Cast with Maddie Keewum about once a month. And then you can still find me in the GOAT district. Um, you know, I'm going to be on there some Wednesdays this season. So I'm very busy here. Uh, you can also find my waiver wire article. Uh, and I'm doing a sleepers article and then kind of like a, a takeaways article called the two minute drill. Uh, so I'm, I'm all over here at player profiler and in Dario, I think it's awesome what you're doing. Um, it's a very, very cool thing. You're going to see a lot of the country. You're going to see a lot of stadiums. This is tremendous. And I'm glad you stopped here on long Island and, uh, on your journey, this was uh, really cool to, to have you in my home and podcast from here, man. I feel like you're Joe Rogan right now <laughs> in studio, just ripping it. Yeah, no, it's all. I mean, it's funny because this morning, like you said, it was, was kind of crazy, and we both got other work to do. So actually, yeah. just getting down. Dario walked in my house when I had two of my kids getting on the bus, and then he was here before my youngest gets on the bus to go to nursery school. So it's uh, you're you're you know, it's like it's like it's like <laughs> day a, in life. It's a day in the life. Yeah, it's it's crazy. No, in the morning. it's awesome. And everyone, you know, make sure to like subscribe all the little buttons on social media that do the things to help us out go check out fantasy football across america on spotify wherever you get your podcasts um to hear other episodes of this i'm going across the country and meeting in person with all these awesome people across the fantasy football industry so you're not going to want to miss that and with that i'll see you on the next one Hey, I want to take a moment to thank you for tuning in. It's important to me that all of our media be free. This is only possible because of you allowing a true independent sports media enterprise to thrive unlike any other in the business. So please subscribe to the All In Package to continue to make all this possible to ensure that all of our stats, information, data, content is available to you, especially you, the people that get the site and get the show.